When it comes to AMD graphics cards, XFX is one of the names that's been in the game for a very long time. They've built a reputation on delivering high quality performance first GPUs with strong cooling and bold designs. Now over the years, we've seen them move from more aggressive standout looks to a cleaner, more minimalistic aesthetic. And that evolution continues with the RX 9000 series with the Quicksilver RX 9070OC Gaming Edition, which keeps that tradition going. Now, despite the name, there's not actually any flashy silver here. Instead, XFX are stuck with a stealthy, dark finish that's all about purpose over flash. The focus is clearly on cooling, efficiency, and clean visuals. And honestly, from a first glance, it works. Now, if you've been following the RX 9000 series so far, you'll know that AMD has gone for strong rasterization performance and tighter power efficiency. And the RX 9070 fits right into that mold. But where XFX wants to stand out is in how they handle cooling, design, and user experience. And that's where the Quicksilver comes into its own. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. All right, stay calm. You've got one job. Do not let this thing overheat. It's running hot. I don't know if it's safe. Get the Wireview Pro. The Wireview Pro safeguards your graphics card with real-time power and temperature monitoring, acoustic alarms for custom thresholds, and sensor pin detection to ensure proper 12VH PWR connection. External sensors can monitor additional components like memory or voltage regulators, while an OLED display provides instant insights, meaning that this is the last time you'll blow a 12VH PWR connector, soldier. To keep your system protected, click the link in the description below. So let's start with the design. XFX has leaned into a more functional, industrial look in recent years, and that theme continues here with the RX 9070. It comes in in an all-black finish, but with a bit of flair. Those top and bottom panels, for instance, are glossy, magnetically attached, and completely removable. XFX even provide 3D printable files for them, so if you want to go that extra mile with customization, you can. Just grab some magnets and, well, you're all set. It's a small touch, but one that gives this otherwise stealthy card a fun bit of personality, and it's something we haven't really seen anyone else offer right now. Now, cooling-wise, we do have three large fans with an unmistakable subtle XFX branding. If it wasn't pointed out, you may never notice it, but I kind of like that. As you'd expect, it's not all for show. This cooler actually means business, though it's odd to see all fans spin the same way, while most GPUs of today see the middle fans spinning in an opposite direction, though on this tier of card, that may make negligible differences anyway. Now, as this forms part of the Quicksilver range, the fans sadly aren't magnetically removable, or, well, easily removable at all for that matter. I get that it's a cost-saving exercise, but it's little things like that which can make a GPU stand out above the competition. Though in the grand scheme of things, I guess it's not a deal-breaker by any means. Now, the card is on the bigger end of the scale, measuring in at 350mm long, 140mm tall, and 67mm thick, making it a proper 3.5 slot card, thanks to the chunky cooler. Now, it is unapologetically big for an RX 9070, but it's also very clean and gives you a sense that, well, it's going to do the job that it sets out to do. Maybe it's just me, but if a GPU comes in on the large end of the scale, it ends up giving off a bit of a vibe that it's good build quality and should be able to handle whatever is thrown at it. Though we'll see if that's the case shortly. On that note though, it does feel extremely well built, even though the shroud is plastic, as there's not huge amounts of flexing and it doesn't feel cheap. Though weighing in at 1,745 grams probably has something to do with that anyway. Now, due to the size and weight, XFX do include a GPU support bracket, and this one's actually worth using. It's metal, adjustable, and hides a little surprise. You unscrew the cap, and well, there's a built-in screwdriver. And then if you flip it around, it becomes a longer handle for the bracket. It's one of those small, thoughtful touches that doesn't need to exist, but kind of adds just a bit of fun to the unboxing experience. And compared to some of the generic plastic stands that we see bundled with more expensive cards, this one actually feels like it has a bit more value to the complete product. Though of course, a full expansion bracket mount will always be the best choice. Now, going back to the card, along the top is the subtle, almost what we're used to, XFX branding. There's a Radeon logo in white and the XFX logo towards the front of the card that essentially is the only form of lighting on the card. 
It's not flashy, it's not in your face, it's just simple and understated. Though if you were to change the magnetically attached panels, you could actually hide this completely if it's not your cup of tea. It's also here where we get a kind of first glimpse of that mammoth heatsink, which spans the full length of the PCB of the card, and then some more. There's a small cutout for the card's dual 8-pin power connectors, and well, other than that, there is a dual BIOS switch towards the rear of the card, but sadly XFX have kind of missed a bit of a trick with this, as it's well exactly the same as the primary BIOS, and instead is more of a backup, while other brands use this as an opportunity to create a quiet mode, or a mode with a slightly tweaked fan curve or clock speeds. This is actually pretty typical of XFX, and again, fits with that mantra of just getting a GPU to market that does the job. Though maybe this will be the quietest and best performing card on the market, so maybe the switch is redundant and straight out the gate, it's the best in the world. Though we will see if that's the case shortly. Now around the back, you've got a full length metal backplate with some rolled edges that just hide the ends of that large heatsink. There's a few gloss lines to style things out and ventilator cutouts that let heat pass through from the massive heatsink underneath. The overall look is very clean with no unnecessary cutouts, no over the top branding, and definitely no RGB light shows, which in 2025, I have to admit, is actually quite refreshing to see that level of restraint. Now, though the card measures in as a three and a half slot card, the IO is only dual slot. And in typical XFX fashion, there's some subtle branding here by the way of the ventilated cutouts that sit above the three DisplayPort connectors and the single HDMI, which is a pretty standard affair for an RX 9070 anyway. Now dismantling the card is pretty easy with the backplate coming off first to then remove the main part of the cooler from the card's PCB. Now if you're wanting to clean the fans, this is well the only way to get to them for a deep clean. Though in all the years of owning a GPU personally, I've never actually fully dismantled a card's cooler for simple maintenance, so I guess it's not really much of a big deal. Now when it comes to heat sinks, XFX never seem to do things by halves, and instead we have a single large block with a large nickel plated copper base plate that makes contact directly with the GPU core and the memory ICs. Though separate contact areas are reserved for transferring heat away from the bulk of the phases, which actually sit a fair distance from the main GPU core. Beyond that, there's a total of five 6mm heat pipes that span the length of the heat sink, and these work to draw heat away from the main core components. Now the back plate, which even though it is made from metal, which will help with heat dissipation, it actually has no thermal pads of any kind. But given that the memory ICs are all on the front of the PCB, I guess this does actually make sense anyway. Now, speaking of the PCB, it measures in at 194 millimeters long and has a 14 phase setup with 11 making up the GPU, including the SOC and the other two plus one for the memory configuration. All phases use the MPS MP87993 Dr. Moss 50 amp MOSFETs, and both the GPU and memory phases are controlled using two MPS MP26868A controllers. In terms of the memory, there are a total of eight SK Hynix GDDR6 ICs on the front of the PCB, surrounding the top, left, and right sides of the GPU core. And as mentioned, unlike lower tier GPUs, there are no memory chips on the rear of the PCB. Now, XFX have also used the Honeywell PTM7950 TIM for, well, all of their 9000 series GPUs thus far. Not purely because it offers better heat dissipation away from the GPU core, but due to the longevity of the material and that all-important application just being a little bit more forgiving during assembly. Now, in terms of the clock speeds, as this is an, well, an OC model, it buffs up on the speed slightly from a 2070 megahertz game clock and a 2520 megahertz boost clock to a much healthier 2210 megahertz game clock and 2700 megahertz boost clock. So at least the extra cost involved kind of gives you around a 7% increase in clock speed over a reference spec. Then the memory speed as expected remains unchanged from the stock reference spec at 2518 megahertz. Now with us wanting to obviously push things a bit further being an AMD card, Overclocking isn't as simple of a feat of just pushing clock speeds and calling it a day, and instead has a bit more of a nuanced process to it, which found us increasing the frequency by 125 megahertz. And for the memory, we managed to push that up by 200 megahertz, now sitting at 2,718 megahertz. But the more important number with pushing any AMD GPU is to actually tweak the voltage, which we actually decreased the offset by 125 millivolts, while still keeping the newfound speeds in check in terms of stability, even when raising the power limit by 10%. We were able to push the memory further, but well, it made no difference to performance. So instead we settled on this as well, there is no secret formula and results may vary card to card and of course, person to person. 
Now to see how the cooling potential holds up during an hour long loop of F124 at stock, temperatures remained under control with our GPU peaking around 60 degrees with memory temperatures also managing a pretty sustained temperature this time of 82 degrees. So on the warmer side, but nothing a kind of cause of concern. Now the reason for this higher temperature on the memory may be down to the fan curve because we didn't see the fan picking up much at all, staying at an almost silent 1160 RPM at its fastest. So XFX have clearly looked to prioritize fan speed over bringing temperatures down. Power wise, things were pretty under control, averaging around 245 watts, which is a little higher than expected, but the increased power headroom that XFX have put on there to keep the boost clock running for longer and higher speeds may actually help in their favor in terms of gaming performance. And well, this is nothing out of the ordinary, considering that this is a pre overclocked card, and that meant that we saw real world speeds of up to 2,370 megahertz, with our average sitting closer to 2,340. So above the 2,210 megahertz game clock, but not quite getting close to that all important 2,700 megahertz boost clock. Also for context, there is actually a reporting bug with memory usage and the sensor. So no, the card didn't manage to find any extra memory above the 16 gig that it comes bundled with. But the memory that does actually feature on the card did manage to see a clock speed of 2,505 megahertz. Now with our manual overclock applied, the GPU temperature didn't actually change much at all, coming in essentially matching our stock performance run. The memory temperature also didn't see any changes from stock with things sitting pretty stable, again at 82 degrees throughout the test. Once again, we find ourselves with very reasonable fan speeds, this time with a kind of only real slight increase up to around the 1200 RPM mark, meaning again, the fans were extremely quiet and wouldn't be heard over the rest of the system's fans. And this is likely why the temperatures remained at the same level. Power draw is where we saw the biggest jump over stock with the max being pulled now coming in at 270 watts, but did see our speeds increase up to 2713 megahertz at their peak, but with an average at a slightly more reasonable 2680 megahertz, while memory saw an increase up to 2704. Now when it comes to gaming performance, in a Playtale Requiem we saw some impressive but not unexpected results from the XFX card, with 3% improvements over the non-overclocked Sapphire Pulse version, and this also brings our average frame rate just over that all-important 60fps mark. The lows didn't see as big of an improvement though, with only a single FPS jump from the Sapphire card's figures, which doesn't do a whole lot to improve the feeling of the game. When we overclock the card, however, we do see an even bigger jump with an 11% boost in performance that also brings the lows up by just under 10%. And this puts the card more in line comparatively with the RTX 5070 Ti and closer to that of a stock 9070 XT. As we move over to Black Myth Wukong, we can see that the Sapphire and XFX cards are pretty much neck and neck in terms of stock performance, with only a single frame between them in both the averages and the lows in favor to the Quicksilver OC card. This small jump in performance could be the result of a few things, including but not limited to the overclock, the beefier cooler, or could simply just be margin of error. That aside, when we overclock the card further, we do see a healthy 12 to 13% boost in the average frame rate and similar increases in the 1% lows. Though in a game like this, at this level of performance, upscaling is going to be needed anyway, or at the very least, to reduce the resolution or visual quality settings. Lastly, in Cyberpunk, this was another instance where the Quicksilver only managed to sit a single FPS ahead of the Sapphire Pulse, with identical lows to match. Again though, we do see, through overclocking the card, that it makes a sizable difference to performance of 11%. This again puts it just behind the 9070 XT levels of performance by just under 4%, showing that this card definitely has the headroom and can land some strong numbers with a small amount of tweaking. When we compare temperatures directly to another RX 9070 model, albeit one that isn't pre-overclocked, we can see that temperatures really aren't all that different. At stock, we see that the bigger cooler on the XFX model doesn't offer up any tangible difference over a reference spec card, though with a higher level of boost that's almost expected as it comes in with 3 degrees warmer temperatures on the GPU core, and the overclock gave us a margin of error similar result there too. Looking at the memory temperature is a bit more telling though, as we can see that the stock and overclock results for the Quicksilver came in identically, which can again be put down to the higher fan speed when pushed further. What's good to see here though is that the XFX card did come in 4 degrees cooler on average in terms of the memory, and while it's not a massive difference, that 4 degrees can go a long way when it comes to PC hardware. So wrapping things up, and well, let's go back to design. This is a card that doesn't try to steal the spotlight with a flashy design or over the top features. But that's kind of the point. What you're getting here is, is, I guess, a refreshingly understated GPU that puts all of its focus on practicality, thermal efficiency, and just overall clean aesthetics. 
it's functional, thoughtfully built, and for the most part, it just gets out of your way. No gimmicks, no distractions, just solid performance with a bit of character thanks to touches like the magnetic panels and the built-in screwdriver tucked into the support bracket. Those things might not change your frame rate, but they do show that XFX is paying attention to the little things that just round out the overall ownership experience. Now, when it comes to actual performance, the Quicksilver lives up to its OC branding. Compared to MSRP tier cards like the Sapphire Pulse, it did consistently deliver stronger results across the board. And when you start to overclock it yourself, there is still some extra headroom to be had. In our testing, we saw a solid average performance uplift over the Sapphire Pulse, which I guess is exactly the type of thing you want to see when stepping up to a more premium pre-factory overclock variant. It also puts the card within striking distance of much more expensive options like the RTX 4080, the 5070 Ti, and again, even the RX 9070 XT. Cooling performance, meanwhile, is I guess where the Quicksilver really makes its mark. Despite its size, the thermal solution here is surprisingly refined. The triple fan setup and the full length heatsink kept core temperatures comfortably under control, both at stock and overclocked. And importantly, it did so while remaining whisper quiet. Fan speeds rarely broke 1100 RPM at stock, and even when overclocked, they only just nudged just above 1200 RPM. That kind of noise profile is impressive for any high performance GPU, but especially so on a card with this level of power draw. Speaking of which, power consumption did stay within expectations, pulling around 245 watts at stock and nudging up to 270 under an overclock, which is well within reasonable limits given the caliber of card and its associated clock speeds. So, that all leads us to the most complicated part, pricing. The card is listed at $649, though currently sold out, but that puts it only $50 shy of the RX 9070 XT's MSRP. And that's where things get tricky. Performance-wise, the XT is simply the better value if you can find one at or near retail. And in the grand scheme of things, the RX 9070, even in OC form, is arguably one of the tougher sales in AMD's current lineup. The gap between it and the XT just isn't huge in terms of price, but it's definitely wider in terms of performance, though there is a caveat. While the price of this is closer to what the XT should be, it's not. <laughs> so all that's happened is the goalposts have simply been moved. The disparity of where it should be, MSRP versus MSRP, is around the same, but the price of this is higher and the price of the XT is higher. So we're kind of in the same situation, but just paying more money. And that's not good for anyone because it leaves you with choices of waiting or biting the bullet and going for it anyway. And well, that said, if you've already decided on the 9070 and you want one that runs quiet, stays cool and looks clean in your system, then yeah, it does make a strong case for itself. It's well engineered, neatly put together, and doesn't feel like it cuts corners, unlike some of the more budget focused cards that hit MSRP, but instead sacrifice build quality and thermals to get there. But it all comes down to pricing. If, here's a big if, it's always a big if, if pricing can settle closer to the $600 mark, or better yet, below it, then this card becomes a much easier recommendation. I am though still hesitant due to the 9070 XT, even as stock reference models being the better buy. Though again, pricing is just so all over the place that it's harder than ever to recommend one card over another when you just don't know what price it's actually available for. And at $649 or above, definitely starts to stretch the idea of value, especially with the XT looming just above it. In theory, I guess. Still, for what it is, the XFX Quicksilver 9070 OC delivers on what it's meant to, with a card that doesn't need RGB or flashy branding to prove itself. And for the right buyer, that's going to be exactly what they're looking for, even if it means paying a little bit more for it. So there we have it. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, we've got a Patreon where you can support what we do while getting access to some really cool extras too, including behind the scenes content, super special area on our Discord, and much, much more. The link is as always down below. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.